Hello, and welcome to another episode of Such a Nightmare, Conversations About Horror. Again, I'm Dr. Catherine Troyer, and joining me is Anthony Tresca. Hello there. Thank you for tuning in again. If this is your first time listening in, a little bit about our podcast. This is a podcast devoted to thoughtful discussions about that fine line between the horrific and the horrible. Each episode looks at a specific horror text that is, for better or worse, giving us nightmares. We both love horror. We both love talking about horror. And in particular, we like talking about things that shouldn't work, but sometimes do, or things that should work and, for a large amount of people, do work, but just for us, miss the mark. Today, we're going to be talking about one of those films. That is 2018's Hereditary. Now, before we get to Hereditary, a little bit of framework to get us started. So if you've been listening to our other episodes, or if this is your first time, my PhD is in humanities with a specific focus on the horror genre, particularly American horror. And I think that one of the best ways to critically think about a genre is to turn to the scholars who are writing about not just specific texts, but are writing about specific texts and linking it to, say, Freud or psychoanalysis or um, gender studies, some of these bigger concepts. I've mentioned Barbara Creed before, but I would like to really dive deeper into her concept of the monstrous feminine, because I think that for a film like Hereditary, it's a really perfect framework, especially when you consider the last few minutes of the film. Yes, uh, and it will lead us into some of our problems with this film. Most yeah. certainly it will. Barbara Creed wrote a book in 1993 called The Monstrous Feminine, film feminism and psychoanalysis and in this book she was really sort of working with and against and and creating tension with some of Freud's ideas about the female and you know the female envying the male and castration and things like that. He had some very very fun ideas when it came to women. (laughs) Yeah absolutely and Creed's like hmm let's let's maybe think about this a little bit more. What questioning Freud? I know. Who would have thought? I know and so she said you know if we look at like a lot of horror and, and psychoanalysis that was existing before that, people were just like, ah, oh, poor women, they're just always the victims. Because, you know, what else could they possibly be in this world? Mm. And Creed was like, well, except for all the times that they're this monstrous figure. And so she divides it, she has different categories. She talks about, like, the woman as vampire, and she, of course, goes back to Dracula, but then to other films as well. But she also talks about witches, which is part of the reason that I think this is particularly fitting. Mm. And then she also talks about the fact that, think about the number of times that the female body is sort of made into this grotesque or monstrous figure. So Creed is saying, like, look at, look at all the times that the female body is depicted in this way. And one of her examples, which again, I think is very relevant for hereditary is actually Medusa and the severed head. Mm-hmm. And we, we see some of that at work in here. And so essentially she, she looks at this idea of that, in the current patriarchal system in which horror films are created and and produced, the female is victim, yes, but she is just as much fabricated to be monstrous. So that what is monstrous? That which is not masculine or male. Mm -hmm. And and I think that if we look at this film, both if we look at um, the role of the sister, but also the role of the mother and the grandmother and... Uh, all the women really in this film that one of the ways in which I have problems with this film is it sort of like shift into this monstrous feminine framework that I'm not sure it, the rest of the film fits comfortably into. I can definitely see why you've chosen this framework for hereditary, uh, particularly due to the prominence of women in this role, which is interesting because hereditary, which is a 2018 film was written and directed by Ari Aster, who is a male. Uh, It's Aster's first feature film and his directorial debut. He's worked on seven short films before this. So Aster was a very, very huge film buff growing up, and some of his earliest obsessions were actually in the horror genre. But despite this, Aster really wanted to steer away from the horror genre, uh, because, as he told in an interview with The Verge, I've been resisting writing horror film for a long time, mostly because it wasn't a genre that had been exciting me. He didn't really like the, like, the 
as he described it, like cliche gore fest or stalked teenage films. And you know, when I think about all the things that are right about this film, I think it shows someone who is very attuned to the fact that the horror genre is more than just shock or, you know, nudity and blood. Like you Mm -hmm. can tell that he has thought carefully about what it means to create a horror film, even if that wasn't, as we'll get into, entirely the intention. Even if it didn't stick the landing, because uh, he ta- he talks about that. He talks about how he wanted to make something more uh, existential in nature and trying to play with serious fears and engaging with them on a serious level. Those were the type of ones that he was interested in watching and interested in making. And that desire to make a different type of horror film led him to writing Hereditary. And he originally, uh, you can hear this in just about any interview that he talks about this film, he originally pitched it as a family tragedy, not a straight horror film. Which I think is where the legitimate sort of profound horror comes mm-hmm. from. So, uh, you know, there's no no need to be coy. Anthony and my biggest complaints are going to be the fact that we have a problem with the last four minutes. Uh, it's a little bit more complicated than that. We'll get into it, but but really yeah. it's about it's about the ending of the film. And so the rest of it, right, the part where it is this family drama, the part where it is this, like, how fundamentally devastating it is to have this happen, um, you know, all Loss of that. Loss and grieving. And, and, and illness and isolation. And I think on that level, it's a really effective film. I feel like we should give him props for having said, this is what I want to create, because that is... For the most part, what he did create, and he he speaks to that kind of like he recog- he himself recognizes that it is two separate films containing two separate components. And in Vanity Fair interview, he said there was a conscious decision to separate the movie into two halves that are almost completely inextricable from each other, where the two parts are actually the same movie. It begins as a family tragedy and then continues down that path, but gradually becomes a full blown nightmare. One of the things that I, it almost feels like when it comes to that conclusion is that he was like, okay, write me a scary conclusion to a family horror. And they're like, well, what's the story? And he's like, it doesn't matter. You just write me an ending and then we'll just (laughs) add it on. Because that's, to me, how disparate those those parts feel. Mm -hmm. It's not as connected as this quote makes it out to be. Correct. Filming for this film began in February 2017 in Utah. And... Exterior shots in the school scenes were shot on location, but everything else was shot in a constructed soundstage so that the walls could be removed to shoot scenes at a much greater distance than a practical location would allow and would allow the filmmakers and the cinematographers to create that dollhouse aesthetic that the film uh, so successfully uses. And when it premiered, its reception was extremely positive. Uh, Rotten Tomatoes' score of... 89% 89% Metacritic wow. score of 87 but it was not universally loved by audiences and the audience scores on both of these other websites have got a 65 on Rotten Tomatoes and a 7 on Metacritic and I think pro- part of the problems with this film may have been how A24 Mark chooses to market these kind of weirder flicks because A24 chose to market it as a straightforward horror film which Astor himself does not agree with he doesn't think that this is a straight horror uh, straightforward horror film But the film's trailers market it as if it's going to be jump scares galore and just uh, a scare fest throughout and using quotes that are like, it's the scariest film since The Exorcist uh, in their promotion of this film to really just like set audiences expectation up for this horror ride throughout the entirety of it. But for much of the film, it's not that at all. To me, this is like a powerful lesson for the importance of a good trailer. But I think it's also a lesson in the reality that we need to start thinking of the horror genre a little bit more expansively than we do. We need to start maybe thinking about how can we either really forcefully say there's two types of horror or begin to expand audiences' definition of what horror means so that something like this can, can count just as much as Friday the 13th. Yeah, it was more like those cliched gore fests to use that Ari Aster's yes. description. Which, mind you, I love. Yeah, they're. I think they can be perfectly fun. Yes. So despite all of the audience's initial reactions to it, it still became A24, which is the studio that released it, its highest grossing film ever, with $79 million worldwide, worldwide against a $10 million budget, and led to Ari Aster working with the studio again to release his follow-up film, Midsummer, on July 3rd. 2019. 
Hereditary is a film that's only two hours and seven minutes long, and much of the film is very good. Actually, quite good, I would say. Near fantastic. Near fantastic, until we get to the final four minutes of the film proper. Those four minutes are where we have our biggest problems with the film. And you wouldn't think that four minutes in the grand scheme of things would matter, but honestly, it's pretty much a deal breaker for me. So much so that we're going to do something slightly different for this episode. Normally, when we are talking about a text that worked for a lot of people that we have a problem with, uh, we begin by saying, but here are the really great things. We don't want to ignore those. Yeah, because in order to avoid being very trolly and just ranting about a movie. Yes, and, and to kind of, again, keep things within that critical thinking framework. But for this film, if we were to do that, most of our episode except for like the last four minutes, right? <laughs> Would be us talking positively about all of the amazing things that this film does. And then it would just be like, oh, by the way, we had a couple issues. Mm -hmm. So we're going to switch it. And we're actually going to address the, the thing we've been talking about sort of all along. And that is the conclusion and why we have such a problem with it. And then use that as a segue to talk about why, if we can set aside those four minutes, which I, I don't know if we can. Yeah, I'm not sure. Because upon an initial watching, I thought that you could because it, seems like it, the ending kind of comes out of nowhere. Yes. But upon a rewatch, the strands are laid there. It, the yeah. foreshadowing is there for this twist. And I, you can't see it, but I did quotation marks uh, there. Yeah. Uh, this twist, there, it is there. So, so let's talk about that. This is a film that really is about this family horror. It's about the devastation of the loss of a child, but it also the loss of a parent. Mm -hmm. What do you do when you're, the people who you've looked up to, these parental figures, suddenly can't help you anymore? When you realize that they're just as human as you are, right? It's very... Universal themes that really you can, almost anyone can see themselves in, and so it's very scary. Yes. But woven into that are these supernatural elements. Uh -huh. So we find out that Toni Collette's character, her mother has these books that are supernatural and that they have references to these rituals and things that, that are unusual. And you don't really know yet how far it's going to go. Mm -hmm. but, but Annie is, is engaging with them, so we know they're going to be important. And mm -hmm. as the story progresses, we end up seeing... There's st there's little, like, clues throughout the way. Like, yes. we'll see little triangles. We see this in uh, her mother's room, bedroom. Mm -hmm. We encounter the fr Joan from the support group, who at her house, there's some definitely... seance, -y seance -y things. Yeah, some supernatural uh, witchy things yes. when you know things are definitely going to go in a direction where there's no coming back mm -hmm. is when the point of no return which is actually what i wrote down in my notes was oh, nice. yeah. um, <laughs> is, is the, when peter is he wakes up um you know his mom is like skittering around which i didn't mind that i actually thought that was really scary and terrifying very it feels very like uh, exorcisty. Yes. That, in that moment. <laughs> yes, and it was and it was perfectly okay, to, in my opinion, still because it was you know we didn't know for sure if it was real or not. Yeah. But then we start to see the cult is in the home, uh -huh. um, and then they and it's in the form of naked individuals. Yes, who which, are standing in the shadows. And, and then we see him, you know, having to interact with that. And then we see him going up to the treehouse where he's confronted. Following the light source. Yes, where he and his floating mother's body, mm -hmm. where he is confronted by, again, a whole bunch of naked people who are getting ready to worship him in he takes over his new form, which only will work because he's also going to be his sister now. Mm -hmm. and And then it becomes this, and then there's this, like, super just unnecessary line where they're like talk about how they're what they're renouncing religiously speaking and what they're worshiping and it just at that moment and uh they're talking about how uh, i think this is a particularly interesting line that will that ties back into the framework that we're operating under the re so charlie which it was the daughter was the original host of this one of this these eight kings from hell but it was a mistake to put it in the female body and now that Peter that Charlie's essence has been put into Peter's body they've corrected your female body and so now this this king of hell can take over the preferred body that he yeah, wants that desired male host I know why I have a problem with this Anthony 
What is your problem with this conclusion? Large problem with this conclusion is that a lot of the sources of horror from the rest of this film have de uh, dealt in the very real world implications of having to deal with what seemed like mental health uh, things that have been happening and any of the more supernatural elements that had been included in the film thus far had been left ambiguous enough that it could have just been in the head and could have been seeing things and really could have been uh, all chalked up to mental health and it could have been this film had the opportunity to be a really interesting discussion about mental health and how that's passed down from the family and how it's unavoidable so Astor talks about how this film is very Greek in nature and you see that in the English classroom uh, where they're just talking about actually a, a Greek tragedy and how we're all pawns no one has any control over the situation and uh, each care how each character even though they'll have a fatal flaw that doesn't matter so it's all very Greek and this film had the opportunity to take that we're all pawns and none of our character flaws matter because no one has any control and make it about hereditary being hereditary and passed on from family member to family member due to mental health but instead the film skirts on that and makes it a run-of-the-mill, Satan-worshipping convent of witches. And I think you hit the, the nail on the head, right? The title is hereditary. And it's not that the title has to be perfectly in sync with what you're going to do, but it just doesn't work to have it be hereditary because this just happens to be kind of-ish a family of witches, mm -hmm. right? That That's not interesting. No. That's not provocative. I would argue that, that the idea of the monstrous feminine is present in this film no matter what because we have Peter feeling very uncomfortable with his mother mm -hmm. who admits, I didn't want to have you, right? Like, I, I tried to get rid of you while you were in my womb. The monstrous womb was a huge part of the monstrous feminine. Yeah. The castrating mother, right? She's, she's very, she kind of emasculates him at various points. That, to me, is a good use of the monstrous feminine to explore mm -hmm. why there's problems with that. And, and really taking an interesting look at, like, some of those more problematic Freudian things. Yes. Uh, ideas that have come up with, in re relation to women and power and masculinity. Exactly. But instead, in those final minutes, we have the more obvious versions of the monstrous feminine, the witch, mm -hmm. the possessed monster. The imperfect female body. Yeah. And at that point, I think, I don't know if phoned in is the right word, but it really does feel like Astor just said, you know what? Fine. If you want this to be a horror movie, then I will make it a horror movie. They're going to worship the devil. Uh, mm -hmm. Is that good enough for you? <laughs> and the problem is, is that... Mm -hmm. That that is a problem, right? Because that's how the conclusion feels. It feels cheap. And, right. and, and it feels like it does discredit to everything that makes this film really powerful mm -hmm. and meaningful. And you can't ignore the ending because there are signs planted throughout the rest of the film. And this is what the film was building to. And so that means that the film fundamentally is flawed. Because if it's reaching this conclusion, you can't just be like, well, we'll just ignore the last four minutes because the rest of the film was so interesting and had so many good ideas because the film is the sum of its parts. Yes. I remember after first seeing it that um, one of my friends had been looking up some reviews and the best one that he had seen said that the film, it felt like, failed to show its work so that by the final solution in the last few minutes didn't match if you went back with everything else but like you said it is right it does show its work mm -hmm. it just shows its work and arrives at a conclusion that no one really wants to arrive at one of the sequences in this film that i think is way more disturbing than a bunch of naked people and some headless bodies is that dinner scene oh, about 56 minutes in yeah. that to me was a, a source of horror that we need to be talking about so much because more. you saw that it truly affected peter just the raw unfiltered nature of the harsh truth bombs that uh, Annie, his mother, was dropping on him in the moment was scary. And he's dealing, already dealing with this unimaginable grief of being responsible for your sister's death, at least in some way. And he's dealing with that and trying to process it. And all of a sudden, his mother's like, I can't help you. you. You've got that look on your on your face and just goes off on him. And the reason I think that that does fall under horror instead of just drama, right, mm -hmm. is because of this other element of, of this, there's something lurking literally in the corners. Yeah. 
and and again i think it needed to be ambiguous i needed it it needed to be maybe it's supernatural but probably it's just mental illness but does it matter because they're going to experience it the same way <laughs> to me that concept that when you are suffering from the type of mental illness that this family is suffering from what you experience may be just as terrifying as if you had a group of witches after you <laughs> that is horrifying because suddenly i have fears about what's in my own family what could i experience and how might i experience something that is so real but no one else can see it I, that's scary and that's in that that dinner scene the as tension well, of that as well as in other places i mean a one very very strong example of that and where i thought the film was going is when uh peter is sitting in class and he quite literally looks over into something that is reflecting his image and he sees his face except it's not his face what he's doing that face is smiling at him and he's literally seeing things that aren't there and then he just goes crazy and because prior to that we see another this is another classroom scene with peter that moment where he's looking forward and then he looks slightly up and he sees in his mind's eye the rear view mirror Mm -hmm. uh, and he kind of like startled because he realizes there's something behind him right that is something that i think was straight up a this is in his mind we're getting to be privy to that again it, it helps us to to create this this tension of here's what we should be scared of because maybe we weren't born into a family where our grandfather starved to death and our uncle hung himself mm -hmm. and our mother tried to set us on fire while she was sleepwalking but we were born into a family that has history of mental illness yeah i think you could have even just ended it with but we were born into a family period right like That's with all the baggage with all the darkness that would be a good tagline into the, into the film everyone's born with a family yeah <laughs> yeah, that would be fantastic. Hereditary. That, that's, that's where I think this film really shines. Mm -hmm. To avoid this sort of tacked on ending, it wouldn't just be about shaving off those four minutes. No, because the strands are there throughout that are building to this flawed conclusion. So for sure, the, the interior sh scene in Joan's apartment where nobody is in there um, because there's Annie's no, knocking on the no door. There's no reason to do that other than to just confirm that the witching elements are real we did we do absolutely do not need to see that it's so much more the film is so m much more striking when it leaves it up to the imagination and things are still amb uh, ambiguous enough that you can't tell what's real and what's not but that shot where you see the interior where the audience sees it not any of the other characters see it it confirms it for only the audience and that's when you just know it's like oh no Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so that scene, we agree, would have to go. I know you had said that you would want to cut even more of the, like, looking through the books, looking through the pictures, things like that. Well, since we're not going to have the, in my version of Hereditary, we wouldn't have the whole thing where Peter becomes one of the eight kings of hell. I would cut from where Annie is looking at her mother's books and she reads about um, that spirit that will eventually come into the body. We don't need to see that. We can maybe see that her mother, because of this mental illness, started turning to more, like, as astrological things and these stranger higher powers. That might be interesting, but I, we wouldn't need to waste any time reading about this thing because it wouldn't be foreshadowing. No, and it was a little... In a film that is cinematically speaking so stunning, it was a little clumsy to have this, like, mm -hmm. close-up on the book that we see highlighted text that she just happens to go to the right page. Also, if we're talking about, like, things that felt a little clumsy, if I'm part of a cult... <laughs> Oh, yes, yeah. you cult member. Yes, yes, yes of course. And again, let's make it very clear, hypothetical. So oh, yes, of course. In a course, hypothetical situation, if I was part of a cult where I was going to bring a, a king of hell to life. Sounds like a fun time. Yeah. A good Thursday. Would I take photos and put it in a photo album? Like, isn't that the weirdest thing in the world to be like, okay, everyone, don't forget to take photos. And Sally, it's your turn to bring the dip next week. <laughs> like, it doesn't... So, again, like, it just feels really... Clumsy. Now, there maybe that's a book you should oh, write. Nice. Uh, the Secret Life of uh, of the Cult Members. Actually, that would be delightful. That would be quite fun. Nobody can steal that. That's right. It's that's mine. Ours. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but instead, just the whispers, right, would have been enough. So I think honestly, I would have kept um, the scene where Annie is trying to to call forth Charlie, mm -hmm. um, because 
that scene where Peter is crying and it's that kid cry, like it's not the cry of an adult man. Yeah. It's the it's the crying of a boy who's been broken by his mom. And then she starts talking, you know, as Charlie, like all of that, you could be like, well, that might be supernatural or it might be mental illness, but it doesn't matter because either way it is scary. Mm -hmm. And that would have been okay. So so really it would have been just kind of cleaning up those those strands that felt very forced into what is otherwise really a fantastic film. And I think, mm -hmm. I think at this point we could easily shift if you want to talk about the things that really worked great about this film. Yeah. There, and there is quite a lot. I mean, a lot of the, the dollhouse effect that mentioned earlier uh, is very, very effective and very, very striking. It's such a strong, bold choice from a first-time director. It is, because it offers us a framework for understanding everything without it being forced. We're going to see Annie working an awful lot on her little figures. However, <laughs> what I like about this as a framework is that it, it allows us to have some really thoughtful insights into the concept of the home, because it's saying the home is crafted. The home is crafted by oftentimes the female, right? Um, the home is something that from an outsider's perspective, the things that happen in your home may feel small. If your family gets divorced, well, that's just one more statistic in a huge long line of divorced families. But to you on the inside, it feels huge because it's your entire world being broken. So there's some really interesting ways in which having the small miniaturized homes that Annie's working on as a framework uh, for this big home, and we get that in that first shot, right, mm -hmm. where we see a miniature of Peter's room. And then you zoom in on that miniature. And then it becomes real, mm -hmm. quote, real, right? And and the fact that, you know, none of this is real because it is a film and it has been fabricated. I just think that, like you said, for someone who this is their first full-length film, this is a very sophisticated framework Another thing that is quite excellent about this film is just about all of the performances. Oh my gosh. In fact, yes, all of the performances. <laughs> One of the things that Astor has the ability to do that makes him truly a director in my mind is his ability to get his actors to capture grief mm -hmm. in a way that actually physically hurts me to watch. Like, it makes my skin feel raw because that's how raw their performance is. Yeah. And that's every single actor in this film. Even Joan, who is just a, a side character, has a heartbreaking scene where she stops um, Tony Collette's character, Annie, and she explains her loss. And it's just so moving and very hard and hor horrifying to watch because you're like, this is something that real people have to go through. They have to move on after their child has died. Yes. And how do you do that? I also think... Watching, so the first time I watched it, I paid a lot of attention to Tony Collette's performance. Mm -hmm. This time I paid quite a bit of attention to Alex Wolf's performance oh as Peter. Excellent. So there are moments when the character is not crying mm -hmm. or talking for minutes at a yeah, time. There is extended, extended, extended sequences in which Alex Wolf doesn't deliver a single line, and yet he's able to do so much with so little. Yes, and and I think about, it's what, maybe maybe 30 seconds long total, there's that scene when Peter's with his friends under the bleachers, mm -hmm. and he has that anxiety attack. And he says, you know, hold my hand, and his friend, who again, is in it for like maybe two minutes total in the entire film, if we count the party scene, just makes this little face where he's like, yeah, I can do this. It's, it's a little, you know, odd, for me, but I can do it. And it's just like, how amazing is that to have so many real characters? Again, if we go back to in a horror film, which is a challenge unto itself. And uh, Tony Collette has been getting a lot of admiration and praise for this role with all due cause. But if you can, if you can believe it, she actually didn't even want to do this film or a horror film in general. She talked about that in an interview with Verge, but it was because Aster just really understood the dynamics in the family and has such an understanding of what it is to be human and what it is to experience loss. So even Colette herself points to this understanding of fam real families, real people, and real loss as being a, something that drew her to this film, despite the fact that she never had any desire to make a horror film. You can see that in one of the sequences with, with Colette that I think illustrates that most powerfully is what a smart move to not show us mm 
her finding Annie finding Charlie's body. We mm-hmm. hear it right oh. while we're staring at Peter, and then we have this extended sound bridge where we hear her crying over all of these different moments her on the floor with her husband holding her her at the funeral Astor really has a motif of female crying he does this in not only this film but his next film midsummer as well and he really uses it very effectively he knows that there are times that it does feel like your body will not survive what you're going through emotionally and there are no words that can do that feeling justice it is so hard to listen to that sound and Tony Collette's scream for that extended period of time. And you truly do believe that this woman is broken and this family is broken and will never be the same. What do we do when the thing that is most horrifying to us is something that no one else can understand because no one else is seeing it or experiencing or, it? Or yeah, it's like mental illness. Even if you know or have mental illness, people do not experience mental illness the same. When do we cross that line of I'm grieving appropriately and I'm grieving an excessive and dare we say unhealthy amount. And and that line, because you're very right, it's different for everyone. That's not comforting, right? It would be mm-hmm. nice to say, well, you're allowed to cry for 22 days, but you can only cry, you know, a gallon's worth of tears and then you have mm-hmm. to be done. Like instead Once it, you reach a bucket full, you're cut off. That's right. Here's your bucket. You can cry now. That would be really actually, there'd be something kind of nice about that because you're like, my bucket is full. Um, I must stop crying And then you now. pour out your bucket yes. and it's very just freeing. Here's another idea nobody can steal. We're going to implement a bucket policy for griefing. Excellent. <laughs> and, you know, like, as you're so big on rituals, this would work really nicely. Work right? Very well. Surprisingly enough, watching this film, I didn't actually need a bucket for my tears because so much of it is so incredibly right, especially the cinematography and the sound design. I think the best thing about the sound design is when it decides that there doesn't need to be any other sounds, like in the dinner scene, where it knows that the dialogue and the silence will only add to the elements. And then, of course, there's the more, there's the really nice uh, sound design where it has little elements that will pop out at you, the jump scares uh, that are in, in here and are very limited, but are very effective with that sound design. And the house is just very cr- thoroughly creepy and has a very specific sound and feel to it. It's worth mentioning the award-winning supervising sound editor and re-recording mixer, Louis Goldstein, because... Mm-hmm. It's not just the the music that he gives us. No. He's actually mixing it so that we, like you said, hear certain things louder than we would normally, have other things muted when we should be able to hear them. This is a film that, that knows that sound is actually as subjective as is anything else because that we experience. it's a film that's playing with perspective, so why wouldn't sound, if it's already established that sight and the things we're seeing are ba- are different based on our perspective, Shouldn't the sound match that as well? And it's disquieting, but it's appropriate. (laughs) Disquieting. (laughs) But it it also, this is a film that said, well, but maybe, maybe it's scary because it sounds like your house, Mm -hmm. which just sounds normal, except for when it doesn't. And Lost doesn't have any one particular sound that is associated with it. So we're just going to put you in the moment. Maybe one of the things that saddens me the most about Hereditary is that it is beautiful. It is a beautiful example of a film from start to near finish. And one of the ways in which it's beautiful really is the cinematography of this film. There's a sequence where it's this long take that the camera moves from following Peter and then it kind of like actually looks like the cinematographer had to kind of crawl onto the hood of the vehicle Mm -hmm. that Annie is in and then uh you know it sort of shows Peter again I mean this is all in one take all in one take and it's not super long but it's long enough that you notice this continuous take in at a moment when not much is happening and we need to know that not much is happening we need to feel that tension of like look at how much distance there is physically as well as uh, metaphorically between this mother and son and the best way to do that was through this this use of cinematography Astor has worked with the same cinematographer for Hereditary and then he goes to work with him in Midsummer, and you actually see some repeating sort of moves the the flip shot where yes 
uh, where our world's going to be inverted, yeah. essentially. It's a, it comes at the moment when the whole thing is turned on its head, flipped upside down, insert uh, phrase here that means the same thing. Right. The cinematographer in this film in particular has an interesting job because Aster uh, breaks down every single shot in the film and he has each scene and he knows where he wants to put the camera. Because you know and you know roughly where you're going to be, I think it allows it more freedom because you know where you know where you have to do it and you know what you have to shoot, but how you shoot it becomes the focus rather than where you're going to put the camera. And as a director, your job is not to think about the practicality. Your job is to think about the vision, right? So Astrid can say, I want you to capture this scene. And then as a cinematographer, you have to be like, okay, well, since I have to obey the laws of physics, um, I'm <laughs> going to need to figure out how is to... Is that something cinematographers have to do? I don't know. Maybe not. Maybe they can just, like, <laughs> fly. That would explain so much. Um, but unless they have superhero powers, they have to figure out how to implement it. And this this relationship, you can tell that, that the vision is being matched by the, the actual implementation of it. Mm -hmm. An example of this would be one of my favorite visual parts of this film is there's this deep focus where up close we have the crispy hand of the dad, then behind him we see Peter, and then in the corner we see the mom. And we shouldn't be able to see that far back, right? This is an intentional mm -hmm. decision. But what better way to have a quote family portrait than crispy dad possessed mom <laughs> near possessed son like it yeah. just works perfectly this is a film that other than i would argue that really sort of clunky scene where we have the close-up of the mm -hmm. book knows that sometimes we need to be left to figure out what to look at. So we don't always have the super close-ups that we would expect from a more traditional horror film. Oftentimes we have these long shots, somewhere between medium long and long shots, where we have to see the entire family, the distance between them, their home. Um, this is just a film that knows how to shoot for tension and how to show us tension visually. So to kind of wrap up our thoughts on this film, the real problem for us does kind of boil down to uh, what Astor himself talks about, the two stories that are going on in his film. You have the family drama, and you have the more typical, I mean, not to nothing against him, but it's like the cliched thing that he was talking about himself that he doesn't like, that witching type of element, the satanic demon, p demonic possession elements that are going on, and how those two just don't work together and I think it, and I don't think it's because of the impossible task of taking two seemingly diverse topics and making them into one film I think mm -hmm. it really is because he just you can tell that he was resisting it right because we have seen films in which there are these like clear and now we have act two which is very different from act one and yet uh -huh. nevertheless related that do it very effectively and that's actually the next film that we're going to talk about yeah. which is the 2008 French film Martyrs. Again, the French version, not the American remake. No. And we're choosing that film next in part because we think one of the themes that's sort of underneath uh -huh. Hereditary is done perhaps more effectively in Martyrs. Yeah, it's this theme of, that you, you see on the chalkboard, punishment brings wisdom, and you see this in the ritual books that Annie's mother has, vulnerable, vulnerable complete, unlocked. And so it's this idea that through tremendous suffering, you will come out a different person and a more enlightened person, perhaps, on the other side. And while Hereditary does in some parts do this, is it shows us a uh, chart once Charlie's spirit is inside Peter and it becomes one of the eight rulers of hell, It's you could read this as being more enlightened. And it does technically fulfill these little drops that have been throughout, planted throughout the film, but it's also an element that Martyrs plays on and that we will be talking about next time. So this is going to be our first non-American film that we're going to be looking at. Mm -hmm. This is also a film that you may not have seen, but it is a film that you want to watch before you listen to our podcast mm -hmm. episode because... Whereas I think we're not really spoiling anything to say, talk about the last four minutes of Hereditary being about witches. What we will be talking about regarding martyrs will definitely mm -hmm. be spoiling things. And this is a film that you need to go into blind. So please yeah. watch it and then join us next time. Yeah. And so in the meantime, give us a like, 
Thank you for listening as always. And be sure to tune in next time where we will be talking about Mario's.